Here's Lacazette, fine first touch, opens up his body and finds the top corner. What a finish. Arsenal in front through Alexander Lacazette. What a sublime goal that is. Mesut Ozil through on goal here, squares it to Aaron Ramsey, bit of a mix-up and Aubameyang finishes the chance, Aubameyang doubles Arsenal's lead, Arsenal 2, Everton 0, just three minutes after the Gunners initially opened the scoring, they have seemingly killed off Everton. Bonjour and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, sponsored by Loserpool.com. As always, I'm your host, Harry Simiou, and on this week's podcast, we'll be reflecting on the 2-0 win over Everton, talking Torreira, Ramsey, Lacazette, Czech, and of course, more. Joining me later on in the show is my Love Sport radio colleague, Chris, otherwise known as Suburban Guna, and the excellent was the man behind one of my favourite Arsenal Twitter accounts. But before we hear from these guys, as usual, I'm going to give my thoughts on the weekend's happenings, should I say. Arsenal 2, Everton nil our fifth successive victory in all competitions. And guess what, guys? We're slowly climbing up the Premier League table, currently sitting in sixth place, level on points with our homeless arch rivals and above Manchester United. But perhaps more importantly, we got our first clean sheet. Um, and that's something that I've been going on about for a while. So definitely pleased that we finally managed to keep one and, and happy for Petr Cech because he's deserved it, to be quite frank. Uh, Lucas Torreira finally started a Premier League game. And I just think with him in the side, we had a far better balance. He's willing to drop in between the central defenders to receive the ball or even to cover when Bellerin or Monreal have bombed forward. And his natural defensive instincts are something that I feel we've really missed in the middle of the park this season. He's always so mobile, picking up loose balls in the middle of the park, etc. And he just complements Granit Xhaka so, so well. I was, of course, disappointed to see Socrates have to go off injured. He was really starting to stamp his authority on this team. I thought he was excellent up at Newcastle, impressive in the Europa League against Vorskla on Thursday and started the game versus Everton very, very well. It would appear he picked up uh, a knee injury when making that challenge in the first half on Theo Walcott, the one that he was subsequently booked for. I'm hopeful it's just an impact injury. Unai Emery's spoken about it today. He said that it is just, uh, well, they expect it not to be anything serious. So hopefully there's good news to come from that situation. I must admit, I enjoyed watching him jog over and tell Shkod Ram Mustafi off afterwards because it was his sort of careless defending that, that led to that situation and resulted in, in Socrates having to make that challenge. A positive to take from that unfortunate situation, though, was the performance of Rob Holding when he came on. I thought he looked very assured and showed the kind of composure that had many believing he'd go on to greater things after that FA Cup final victory against Chelsea back in 2017. Hasn't quite happened for him since, uh, but hopefully under Emery's guidance and, and with Socrates' experience, he can he can learn a thing or two this season. I think it says a lot that Emery was willing to loan Callum Chambers out and keep holding. Yeah, you could argue that perhaps nobody came in for holding, but obviously Emery feels that this guy has potential and this guy can play uh, his way and, and be a part of his squad. Now, it has to be said, although it's the points that matter at the end of the day, the performance was far from convincing. Petr Cech was named man of the match, and I guess that tells you a lot about how the game itself unfolded. Everton had six attempts on target, one more than us, and Richarlison was a constant threat, particularly in that first half. Dominic Calvert-Lewin also spurned a golden opportunity at 0-0 when he was foiled by Petr Cech in a 1v1 situation. I understand that there's some people out there that want to see Bernd Leno giving, given sorry, an opportunity but when Czech is displaying this type, sort of form, you know, it, it's very difficult to drop him. He's playing probably his best football in an Arsenal shirt. And to disrupt that momentum would just be wrong, in my opinion. Yes, he's had his problems with the ball at his feet. Um, but that's part of the transition. That's part of being asked to play in a totally different way. And I know there were still a couple of moments at the weekend, but it, it seems to be improving anyway, slowly but surely. As per usual... 
a couple of moments where our insistence on playing out from the back put us into potentially dangerous situations. And I recall Granit Xhaka almost being dispossessed on the edge of our penalty area, facing his own goal. Fortunately for us, he was able to get a foot in and temporarily avert the danger at least. But after that happened, Petr Cech and Socrates in particular, before he was substituted, of course, finally applied some common sense and were kicking it long when necessary. And, and that's all I want to see. I understand that there's a plan in place, but you need to react to the game and the situation first and foremost. The manager will need to believe in his players to make the right choices in those key moments. Of course, we've got to talk about Alexander Lacazette's finish. I mean, that was textbook, sublime, fantastic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in off the post or bar, whatever it was, always makes it look a little bit better as well for the cameras. Um, Jordan Pickford, absolutely no chance of stopping that. And, you know, just what a finish. First touch was brilliant. Second touch, bang, absolutely fantastic. And he seems to be playing with a lot of confidence at the moment. He's probably working harder than he ever has in an Arsenal shirt. And it seems that Emery's decision to leave him out in the early weeks has really, really fired him up. He's playing like a player with a point to prove, and he, he isn't about to give that position at centre-forward up without a fight. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang got a goal, another one. I said on the Vorskla Review Show that I felt it was a masterstroke by Emery to include him for confidence reasons. And whilst his goal appeared to be offside... We'll pretend that wasn't the case, of course. Um, you know, he still had to finish it. He still had to react quickly, and he did that. Um, but was anybody else screaming for Mesut Ozil to just go alone there? You know, the way he broke through, I was just sitting in the North Bank, willing him to just open up his foot and put it in the bottom corner. But I guess it doesn't really matter now because the goal stood, the goal went in, uh, even if we did almost fuck it up. Um Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC uh, if you too were, were shouting for Ozil to go alone. We even got to see the Aubameyang somersault when he scored, which is always pleasing on the eye. Although if I was the manager, I'd be banning that shit with zero hesitation. I mean, what if he gets injured doing it? How brilliant was Alexander Iwobi when he came on? He worked tirelessly, was explosive, powerful, direct, purposeful, and received rapturous applause from the entire stadium when he engaged in a full-blown sprint across the Everton defence and ended by closing down Jordan Pickford. Brilliant cameo appearance from the Nigerian, and he seems a lot more focused and determined under the new manager. Lauren Koscielny uh, put some comments in his programme notes where he said it was time for Alex Iwobi to realise just how good he can be. And he says that the player is on the right track and has certainly been motivated uh, by Unai Emery coming in. So that's great to hear. And Iwobi is a player I've always believed in. I've always felt that he has the potential. He's got the raw talent. It just seems that at times his concentration wasn't always there. His focus maybe wasn't quite there. But now under Umar Emery, he seems a, a, a new player. And, and I'm excited to see what the future holds for this young talent. Juan Carlos Carcedo, Emery's right-hand man, was often seen in the technical area this weekend, barking out instructions. And it's encouraging to see a coach involved, you know. It's something we've not been used to seeing from the likes of Steve Bold, Pat Rice, or indeed anybody else over the, the years. The desire to succeed from this new management team is, is clear for everyone to see. And although the performances haven't always been as excited as scintillating, the results are starting to come. And at this early stage, I guess that's good enough for me. Moving away from Arsenal for a second, I had the fortune or misfortune, depending on your viewpoint, of watching Manchester United against Wolves on Saturday afternoon. Um, I was covering that game and, and when I see Alexis Sanchez playing for them, I can't believe I'm looking at the same player. You know, he's been absolutely hopeless since he's gone there. Read a tweet today from a United fan saying... Eight months on 500 grand a week and the best thing Sanchez has done in a United shirt is play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on a piano. <laughs> it seems to me that bringing in Aubameyang was, was a far better bit of business and, and Sanchez has now, you know, gone 831 minutes without scoring a goal in the Premier League. End of the day, his greed has been his own downfall because he certainly wouldn't have gone that long in an Arsenal shirt without scoring. I guess it goes to show what a big role Mesut Ozil played in his success and indeed Arsene Wenger, I guess, for giving him that free reign. Of course, under Mourinho, he's asked to be a lot more disciplined and that hampers him, you know. Um, so, yeah, 
not really a Manchester United podcast, of course, but uh, I thought I'd get my little dig towards Alexis Sanchez in and, and what a flop he's been at Old Trafford. Uh, that's enough from me. I'm going to take a short break. And when we return, I'll be joined on the line by Chris, or more commonly known as the Suburban Guna. Enjoying what you've heard so far? If so, make sure you hit that subscribe button and leave us a review on iTunes. Making his debut on the Chronicles of Aguna is Suburb Aguna. Chris, welcome to the show, mate. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Recovering from the rain yesterday, but, you know, we'll get over it. <laughs> Winter is well and truly here. Um, Chris, we finally kept the clean sheet under Unai Emery. What were your overall thoughts on the game? Well, uh, I think the first half left a lot to be desired with. I think we can probably all agree with that. Um, I was pleased with the the actual team lineup. So you and I have obviously spoken about this quite a bit um, on the on the show that we do. Um, but I've spoken with lads in the pub as well, and it feels like that formation is and not formation, but that starting eleven was the starting eleven that we've all kind of been crying out for for probably about two or three weeks. And the, the inclusion of Torreira, I think, made a big difference. Um, and certainly, he just feels a little bit more calmer uh, when, you know, we've got him at the base of our midfield. I know it's early days. He's only had one start, but he's, he was very impressive. One of the few players that was impressive in that first half, I have to say, because we looked a bit ropey, particularly from a fullback perspective. So... Within a couple of minutes, I think. Was it Theo Walker or was it Calvert-Lewin that got yeah, in on the right-hand yeah, side? Calvert-Lewin, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so when that was, I mean, that was up uh, that was up my end. And when when he got, when he raced to wrong goal, I actually thought it was Theo Walker at first because he's on that right-hand side. You're just thinking, here we go. Uh, same as usual, just a simple ball into the channels. You get a pacey forward that just gets in behind and we're one down. But... I think Petr Cech set the tone for the day within about three minutes by making that crucial save, and he just kept doing it for the rest of the rest of the uh, rest of the afternoon. And then the second half, you know, we, we were nervy for the first ten minutes, but it felt—I don't know what you feel—but it felt to me like the first the first goal, we we seemed to relax a bit more, we started to play a bit more. But as soon as the second goal went in, it felt like we went into full in-game management, and that's the first time I can say that we, it felt like we were actually managing the game for, I, I don't even remember the last time that we actually managed the game properly. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And and Chris, this is something that I've been trying to work out for a few weeks now, and I, I want to get your take on it. Do you think that there's some sort of plan in place for Arsenal to go out and play, be a little bit more reserved in the first half of games? Because it seems like we, particularly in the last three, four weeks, that we were a different team in the second half. Do you think that's a... a deliberate ploy or do you think it's just he gets them in at half time he gives them a bollock in they come out and, and fix up basically I think I think there is something to that a hundred percent it does feel like we're very very risk averse in the first half but despite saying that we still concede uh, goals we've still conceded goals in the first half we've also given away some really big opportunities in the first half so it's not like we can say well we're be you know we're we're staying tight at the back. We're not being very exciting to watch. It just feels like there's an, an element of apprehension about the way that we play. And it's almost as if he's like second half. It gives them, yeah, he maybe gives them a kick in and says, right, here we go, lads. You know, you've got to step up now. So it's it's very odd because normally you associate, you know, if a team's going to, if a team's going to be slow to start, they're normally a bit cautious, but we don't seem to have that caution in defence. I don't know whether or not that's just because we haven't got a very good defence. I think that's because shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah, there is that bit at the back. And I'm not convinced. I mean, Bellerin and Monreal didn't have the greatest of first halves. I thought the second half they were better, probably because Richarlison just disappeared out of the game in the second half. And that allowed Bellerin to, to push forward a bit. And we saw more of him going forward. And Bellerin going forward is always more of an exciting prospect than Bellerin at the back. Yeah, can't disagree with that. Um, Chris, we spoke on last week's A Little Bit Arsenal show at length regarding Aubameyang starting from the left. Him and Lacazette both got themselves on the score sheet this weekend. Are you hopeful we can get the best out of both, though, in this current formation? Because I'm not entirely convinced of that. No, I don't know how. Long term, if I'm honest, I don't know how we're going to do that. Just purely and simply because... 
Aubameyang is one of those players that plays off the shoulder of the centre forward. You know, his pace, his 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 timing, and it's runs in behind. And right now, you've got to say Lacazette is the man in form, and he deserves to be at the at the apex of our of our uh, attacking um, trio. And it's almost as if it's because Aubameyang is Aubameyang, he's playing, but he does. It's it's, it's a difficult one because he doesn't really do very much in the game and then he'll just set the game alight. And this happened in midweek against Vorskai. He didn't really do very much. And then all of a sudden, bang, a B- a Wobi gets the ball on the left-hand side, sprints away, puts a really good ball in and he's sliding the ball in. And that's classic Aubameyang. It's really, really quiet. And then, you know, explosive and deadly inside the box. And when you've got someone like that, it's really difficult to leave him out because he could do absolutely bugger all for 30 minutes in the first half or second half or whatever it is and then just come up with an absolute peach of a goal, or he does what he did uh, with that second goal, which is a really weird second goal, because Ozil, I don't know why he didn't just tuck it away, but if you, I watched that again a couple of times, and it's almost like a natural predator's finish, and he just scores those every single time. He just doesn't miss. Yeah, I mean, I've mentioned earlier on in the show that I was literally screaming for Mesut Ozil to just go on his own, and you know, the angle I was looking at it from, because I'm in block six, so... I was kind of in the corner and looking at it diagonally. And I could see that if Ozil just opened up his boot and put it in the far corner, the keeper would have had no chance. And when he squared it, I thought, oh God, what have you done here? It was a bit like the Perez Henri moment where (laughs) you're in a golden opportunity and you've just messed it up because of being indecisive, basically. And and that really wound me up. So thankfully, we didn't fuck it up completely. (laughs) Yeah. Do you not think, do you not think that there's an element of confidence though about it? It just feels like he hasn't, he's not quite there. It's almost as if he's having to build his his confidence slowly from taking what is essentially a massive battering from his home country. It's like he's, everyone in his country is against him. And then when he's got his fellow peers, uh, you know, you've got players from the Bayern Munich contingent that are making ridiculous yes. comments about the whole situation. I don't want to go, I, I don't want to go into to that detail because we can talk about that all night, but it feels like he almost needs to be repaired a bit. And I guess, performances you know goals like against Vorskalar and then you know ultimately we scored but if you I watched him after um after Aubameyang tucked that away and did his little uh did his little flick Ramsey turned around almost with a smile on his face like laughing and Ozil almost had this forlorn sort of it was like a forlorn smile I don't know if the cameras picked it up or not but I deliberately just went I looked over at Ozil and he looked like really gutted almost as exasperated in himself and yeah, I don't know whether that's a worrying thing or not, but um, ultimately, you know, we scored. He impacted on the play, and I thought he certainly came alive in the second half, in the last sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, after, certainly after we got the first goal. Yeah, and I thought Ozil's runs off the ball created quite a bit for us yesterday. Yeah, it was brilliant. I, I thought, you know, it, people can look at him and say, you know, he didn't make that many passes as he usually does, or... And things like that. But for me, that that's neither here nor there. Mesut Ozil impacted the game yesterday, and that's the bottom line at the end of the day. Um, Chris, how do you think Rob Holding and Alex Iwobi looked when they were introduced? Well, <laughs> um, let's start with Iwobi. Uh, I don't know if we said this on the show, but um, he's not my. I'm not his biggest fan, if I'm completely honest. And at times, he just drives me insane because he seems for every good piece of play, for every good driving run at a defender, he does. He then will miscontrol a ball or run down a blind alley. So it's almost like half of his game is mistakes and half isn't. But I can't remember any mistakes that he made. I know he only got about 20 minutes uh, yesterday, but I can't remember any real mistakes he made. He pressed, which was really good. He he drove, he had a couple of chances, a couple of dribbles. You know, he didn't lose the ball. So from, from that perspective, you have to say it was a very good cameo and probably confidence building cameo as well. Um, from a, uh, from, Holding's point of view, now that's a, that's a different kettle of fish for me because I thought he was brilliant. I genuinely thought when uh, Socrates went off, I thought, oh God, you know, we've got Mustafi who looks like he's hobbling anyway and Holding, who's a young player, has been, you know, he hasn't exactly had the best of years. You know, none of the team really did last year, but Holding, you know, he was in and out of the team, but he coached with the aerial threat well. He, he managed to keep pace. His positioning seemed quite good as well. 
And he didn't look overawed in that position. And from my perspective, you know, we could, I don't know how long, I don't know if you've got any intel on Socrates um, or not, but if he's missing for any prolonged period of time, we don't have any other choice. It's holding or bust. And, you know, I don't think that, you know, we don't have a left back to, to, to tuck Monreal in field. So personally, this was massive for him but also massive for us because he's going to be needed in the next few weeks, I think. Yeah, totally agree. And, and the word on Socrates at the moment is that it is just a knock and that he should be all right. So I'm assuming he'll miss the Brentford game and, and hopefully he'll be back at the weekend to face Watford. But that's not been confirmed. That's Emery's sort of first assessment of things um, before, I guess, the medical team have had a, a real look. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Would you like to let our listeners know how they can follow you on Twitter and how they can check out your fantastic blog? Yes, it's uh, www.suburbangunas.com. And you can also catch Chris on Twitter at Suburban Guna. Be sure to check him out. We're going to take another short break and we'll be back with another guest. The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18 is now on sale. The Chronicles of Aguna tells the story of Arsenal's final season through a supporter's eyes, attempts to shed light on some of the season's major talking points and features exclusive interviews with Ray Parler, Kevin Campbell, Tom Watt and Robbie Lyle. Available to order now from Amazon, Waterstones and all major bookstores, The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18. Order your copy now by clicking the link in the description. Welcome back to the third and final part of episode 27, sponsored by Loserpool. Joining me is our second guest of the week, goes by the name of Woz, and is the man behind one of my favourite Arsenal Twitter accounts. Always has plenty of insightful and interesting things to say. No pressure, mate. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> How are you? How you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm very good, thanks, mate. Cheers for having us on. Looking forward to it. No worries at all. You're welcome anytime, mate. And I uh, just want to say I really enjoyed those tactical videos that you've done uh, after the City game. I really like that. I thought it was a brilliant idea. Thanks, mate. Yeah, I'm going to look to make it more of a regular feature, but as you probably know, it's all very time-consuming. So hopefully I'm settling down at the start of next month to carry on doing it as a weekly feature, so we'll see how it goes. But Emery's got to keep providing us with the, uh, with the sort of material, isn't he? That's right, that's right. And, you know, tactics is not something we're used to seeing, is it? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's certainly very interesting. Um, I want to talk to you about Aaron Ramsey, first of all, because many people feel his performances have dropped of late, whether that's down to the contract situation or, or, or what, you know, I guess we'll never know. But how do you feel he's gotten on under Unai Emery so far? He's been a little bit quiet, hasn't he? Yeah, especially on the ball, definitely. Um, I think we're so used to seeing Ramsey play from a deeper position and, and often people don't don't really enjoy that. Because, But I just do think Aaron is better on the ball. He's, he's far better behind the play, if you know what I mean, progressing towards the play rather than being in front of the play where he's back to goal and, and receiving it to feed. A lot of people see him as a, as a number 10 because of, of how high he likes to get in games, but he covers great distances. And, and to be honest with you, he's worked very, very hard off the ball. I mean, the Newcastle game, he made the most ball recoveries on the pitch. And and I think the issue with Aaron, because of the seasons he's had, the really good years of all the goals and the spectacular volleys and great, great contributions during the game, we, we sort of expect that all the time. And we've seen a bit of a, more of a nitty gritty Ramsey, which unfortunately in sort of that number 10 role isn't what you want. You want a bit of a Rolls Royce, don't you? But Emery obviously likes him. He named him as one of his, his, his sort of five captains. That's he right. likes his energy. Yeah, he, he, his consistent work rate. He, he never, never stops running. He never hides. No matter how many times he gives it away, no matter how many times he messes it up, he will always continue and keep going. And um, I thought, like you said, I mean, he hasn't really hit any sort of form this season, which for me is, is, is quite promising because he's still contributing in, in other ways. And I'm hoping that it will click and he will start getting his um, confidence back on the ball. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Um, I was just talking to Chris previously and we, we were trying to work out why it is that Arsenal seem to come out stronger in the second half lately. And and we were debating whether it's a deliberate ploy by the manager to be a little bit more cautious, a little bit more reserved. And, you know, obviously we're still conceding chances. That's just because we're shit defensively, to be honest. Um, but yeah, what's yeah. your take on it? What do you put it down to? Because it's been a common thing, hasn't it? We We come out slow. 
and then we improve in the second half. Yeah, it is interesting. It's, it's almost whether you, to, to sort of, like a boxing analogy, like you let them come out and give all their blows early doors and, and, and maybe take a few hits, but you know in the end you're going to come through. But I'd like to think it's a li- deliberate ploy by Emery, but I'm not, not quite so sure at the moment. And I just think that we take a little time to get in our stride and, and especially the, the game against Everton, we really did... Um, we did take a while to get going. And like you said, throughout the season, it's been a common common feature. Up at St. James's, we were pretty poor. And then we, we just sort of burst into life. But again, for me, these are all very promising signs that we can, we, ha- we have got that second gear in us. We have got a manager who we're going in at half time, and, and the players clearly believe in what they're being taught. And, and we, we, we're playing in a new way and we've got to appreciate it. It's going to take, we're possibly looking at 18 months before we're going to see at least, I'd say, three transfer windows because he's not got the personnel he's, that he wants and he's making the most of what he's got and he's implementing his style. And, yeah, not every player will fit in it straight away and it might take time, but he seems to be able to get through to the players. And, and, and we've seen a lot of sound bites from the players in interviews, all of them talking about Emery, he, he, he's the way he executes himself in training, how we're trying to – tactically, we're trying to improve massively. And, and, and you're starting to see rewards – and you're seeing moments with individual players and you're thinking, yeah, he, he's getting to them. And, and when you play like that in the first half, you can see a lot of chance. You go in at half time and you think, well, we're quite lucky here to be sort of still happily in the game. And then you come out and perform like that. You can only take positives from it. And, and Emery, must, you must applaud him for the way he's not just in that game the other day, but the way he takes substitutions early, the way he adapts to the way the game's going and evolving. And that's something we, we didn't see for a few years. And, Yes, people say, oh, why aren't you getting it right in the first place? But, I mean, come on, the guy's been here not even three months and, and the, the club are going through a complete transition. So we can't expect miracles. But I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised and I'm happy with the way it's going. Yeah, it's, it's been encouraging, particularly the last few weeks. I guess I've said it before, I felt like the first couple of games were sort of free hits for Emery. You know, if he'd got anything, it would have been a bonus. But yeah. if we lost, it would have been just business as usual, I guess. So, yeah, I've been pleased with the way things have gone so far. Um, I always look out for your tweets after the game because there's a f- quite a few things that me and you agree on. And <laughs> I, I, I tweet them out and then I think, God, no one's agreeing with me here. And then I see you tweet <laughs> it and I think, all right, you know what? There is someone else out there that thinks the same as me. Um, you tweeted that you felt we looked more comfortable defensively after Socrates' departure. Why do you think yeah. that was? Uh, this, this is not a slight to him. I don't, not him personally. I mean, I must admit, I was, I was pretty underwhelmed at his signing. I'll openly admit that. So far, I've been quite wrong because I've enjoyed the way he plays. I mean, he, you know what you're going to get from Socrates. He is a good old-fashioned centre-back. No frills, no nonsense. I'm not playing out from the back if I don't feel comfortable and I'm just going to wallop it as far as I can, which is fine, which is we, every, every side needs a player like that. But... I just think that I think with him being naturally a, a right-sided player, like most of our centre-backs, th- I don't know whether it was because the team as a whole improved their performance, but I just felt that with holding in there, I know he's again we, we, we're looking at similar sort of players, but it just sort of gives me a glimmer of hope that if we do in a transfer window get that that left-sided centre-back in to partner any one of our current centre-backs, that just the balance and the structure of the team looked a lot better, and we looked calmer, and we started being more composed in possession and. We, create, we conceded a lot less chances, but again, I think we started dominating the midfield, which helped. And it, it just, it'll be interesting to see if, if, if he's out for a couple of games, how we do adapt and how we continue going forward. But I did think we did concede a lot less chances, but it could have been for a number of reasons. But I, I, I did feel more comfortable. It's, it's not about the ability of the individual player. I just felt the balance of the, the back four just improved slightly. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And I think when you're a centre-half playing on the wrong side... I think for the most part you can get away with it, but when your fullbacks are so uh, relentless yeah. in going forward, and then you're having yeah. to come out wider to cover space, then that's when you have a problem, isn't it? Because well, the Theo moment, Theo moment was nail on the head, wasn't it? That's but it. it's lucky. Look, I'm, I mean, the, the kind of player he is, he's a, he's a shit house, isn't he? And it's nice because <laughs> years down the line, I know he got injured from it, but we wouldn't have took Theo out there normally, and yeah. and he probably would have gone in and, and, and crossed it and tap him for a goal. So. Yeah, he, he got him in the wrong position and he got done. But I tell you what, the, the player didn't get past him. So that's what I like about him. He, he's a good old-fashioned centre-back. But again, he's a right-sided one. And like you said, it's, it's very difficult to adapt. And when you're not, he's, let's be brutally honest, he's, he's not terrible on the ball, but he's not, he doesn't look naturally comfortable and he's quick yeah. to release it 
long, which is not a problem. And, but the way Emery's trying to play and the way he's trying to execute, like you're saying, if you're in an un- unnatural position on that left side, everything's different. The ball's not coming across your body. Every, your body position's different all the time. So it will take some adapting and, and whoever plays in that role is going to have a similar sort of problem. But hopefully he's not out for too long because he's, he's impressed me so far. Yeah, that's right. And, and that was one thing I really liked about him yesterday. I thought we had a couple of dodgy moments. I remember one in particular where Granite Shaka almost lost the ball in the end. Yeah, of a bit box. short, yeah. And then I just thought, you know, for the next few minutes, every time the ball came near Socrates, it was like, smash it up the park. Let's get up. Yeah, push, that's up, it. push and, up. Yeah. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed seeing a player sort of take the game by the balls and say, I know I've got this instruction. But I'm going to take the book game by the balls and react to the situation. Careful, Jeff Reeves will be on to you if you carry on, mate. Saying <laughs> balls. <laughs> That's all right. Bring it on. <laughs> you know, I just thought that, that it was nice to see a player take the game and and do what he needed to do. And you know, they are professional footballers. At the end of the day, they should be empowered to make decisions at key moments in games. And it's nice yeah. to see him him doing that and and being a bit of a leader. Now we've had six league fixtures, four wins, two defeats. We've not spoken before, so I wanted to get your your thoughts on what you think is a realistic target for Emery this season. Is a top four finish a real possibility or should we be looking to qualify for the UCL via an alternative route, i.e. the Europa League? I think um, we're, we're, we're very good at the moment. Uh, no, we haven't. We've, we've, done, we've won these four games without really playing that well. We played well in, in spells, but... It's a it's a building process. I do think top four is realistic, only because I th- at the moment teams like Liverpool they're looking fantastic, and 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 City are obviously for me unstoppable. But I take I, t- I took a lot of positives out of the Chelsea game because at the end of the day we went to Stamford Bridge and they've been very good this season. We could, we could have scored five in that first half, and it's it's competing in them big games. At, I mean, you write City off, but the big games at home, I think if you win your home game. It don't matter then what you do away. If you if you if you lose away, whatever it's done to get the top four, win your home games against them other sort of other five teams around you, and then beat the smaller sides. And at the moment, with, with the games like Newcastle away, Cardiff away, they weren't spectacular wins, but they were wins. And at the end of the day, it's all about getting the points under the belt. So, I do think if we continue in that vein and, and dispatch these sort of sides, Fulham coming up away, Palace away. They're difficult games, but if you can get in there and get out with the three points, at the end of the season, you look back on that and think, yeah, that's why we made the top four. And, and obviously last season, realistically, when you look at it, all them games, obviously we didn't, we won one away game in the second half of the season. But if you take some points out of the game, we would have been very close to top four. So I think it is a realistic target. And I'm also hoping that he does get backed in January and we do go out and, and, and look to strengthen the squad in January if possible because it will help us in the long run but yeah I'm I'm happy with our squad I think we do lack certain positions but I think Emery definitely should be attempting to go top four minimum this season and I think it will I think it poss- probably will happen and then like you say the Europa League realistically the group stages I mean we should walk through that and then after that it's pot luck you, you don't you genuinely don't know who you're going to play. It could be any team out of the Champions League and, and, and obviously Chelsea are still in it and, and teams like that. So it'll be exciting. But again, it, for me, it's all about football's about winning trophies and we want to go as far as we can in all the cups. And um, definitely, I've, I've had a night. Like Europa League was fun at first, all the trips and all that. And I'm going again this year. But I'll tell you now, it's boring in life. I just watch <laughs> that Champions League and it hurts me, mate. It really yeah, does it, hurt me. It's when you so, hear that anthem, isn't it? And you, you're sitting on the sofa when we should be in the stadium. Yeah, That's and it's weird. just, you see like Spurs, Spurs when we playing Barcelona at Wembley and we're playing like carrier bag. And, <laughs> but it just, you just think a few years ago, it was <laughs> the other way around, but it's, it's not for an eternity. And I'll tell you now, things are going to change again. And I'm, I'm pleasantly, I'm sorry, I'm looking positively on the rest of this season. And I'm, I'm hoping that top four, can happen and yeah your open league run and hopefully we get a good run in the cups as well because I think he will take even the league cup quite seriously again yep all, all interesting stuff was thank you very very much for your time would you like to tell our listeners how they can follow you on Twitter and keep up with your uh, ramblings <laughs> providing my ramblings are not 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 um, alcohol fueled and <laughs> when I'm angry but yeah I'm, that was a gooner give us a give us a chat on there but um, yeah I don't I don't tweet very well I talk better so <laughs> get carried away on there but it's all fun and games and, and no one means any harm by it so that's right that's right lovely thank you very much mate top man mate all the best 
That brings us to the end of another show. We hope you've enjoyed it. Follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. Subscribe on iTunes or whichever platform you are listening from. And we'd love to hear your feedback on what we can improve, etc. And the type of discussions that you guys would like to hear. After all, without you guys, this podcast is nothing. We'll be back Thursday morning with a look ahead to Arsenal versus Watford. Until then, ciao. hero. He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at Loserpool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Razor pool is similar to loser pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated. <laughs> and so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account, show your sports genius, be the hero.